Hello, everyone. My name is Monica Sack. I am the Senior Director of Conference Programming. And welcome to day six. We've made it six days. I do hope you've all been enjoying the content this week, and we've got a few more days to go, so pace yourselves. Um, upcoming keynotes do include Nabil Ayers on Thursday, Beck on Friday, and Michelle Zanner of Japanese Breakfast on Saturday. And now for our next session. Walking, cycling, driving, trains, flying, scootering these days, and so many more other modes of transportation. These are all ways that affect our lives on a daily basis, whether on an individual level or the transport of goods we all use. Transportation is one of the most important aspects of our lives. It's often both access to roads as well as where those roads are built and trying to balance everything in a way that creates a higher quality of life for everyone. That is just a sliver of what the Department of Transportation is tasked with. Leading the helm right now is Pete Buttigieg, the 19th U.S. Secretary of Transportation. Prior to this appointment, Secretary Buttigieg served two terms as mayor of his hometown in South Bend, Indiana. While there, Mayor Pete, no longer saying his last name, worked across the aisle to transform the city's future and improve residents' lives everywhere. In 2021, he made history as the first openly gay person confirmed to serve in a president's cabinet. And now he's got the task of improving everyday lives for all of the residents in the United States. That's not a big task at all. He can do it. And today we get a chance to learn a little bit more about his vision. Quick note, this is a town hall style session. A portion of this hour will be dedicated to Secretary Pete taking questions from the audience through the mics located in the aisles. They'll be lit up later. There is also the Slido Q&A platform that can be found in the South by Southwest Go app, as well as the online schedule. And now, please welcome to the stage, Secretary Pete. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for the introduction. Thanks to all of you for taking some time with me today. It is really, really good to be back in Austin, really good to be at South by Southwest, and really good to be in a room with this many other human beings. I hope you feel the same way. I'm, I'm flashing back to the last time I was in uh, this place, last time I was doing a town hall under very different circumstances a few years ago, and uh, wearing very different shoes, really excited to talk about what we're doing with the future of US transportation. I hope you'll bear with me too, because I don't know if you're having this experience, but I'm still recovering social muscle memory uh, after the last few years, uh, and getting back into the habit of having exchanges like the one we're about to have. And for that reason, I'm gonna be pretty brief by way of opening remarks and try to get to the conversation quickly. Uh, there are mics set up, and as I explained earlier, you can relay questions uh, from your phone as well. But I do think it's important to tell you a little bit about what we are setting out to do just to frame the conversation. Let me begin by sharing a little bit about what I've seen here in Austin today. I've been with the mayor, my good friend, Steve Adler, uh, who I've known for years and who is leading a community that is committed to making sure that transportation works for everybody. We arrived at the airport where there was a vision for growing it for more capacity uh, and then made our way to the metro, the red line, where there is a vision for expansion that will bring many more people into the kinds of connections that are needed to have access to opportunity, to have access to education, to have access to other people. That only comes if you have a way to get from point A to point B. And through great public transit, creating alternatives for people in communities that were once envisioned as basically having two levels of citizenship. One, if you had the advantage of your own car, and then a different one for everyone else. That's changing here, largely because this city was willing to vote to raise the revenue, in other words, pay more taxes, to have a first-rate transit system in Project Connect, and I'm really rooting for that to be a success here in Austin. There has never been a better time to work in transportation than right now. There's never been a better time to be the U.S. Secretary of Transportation right now. 
And that's, among other things, because we have just seen the passage late last year of the president's bipartisan infrastructure law committing $1.2 trillion to taking American infrastructure to the next level. That's not a small thing, obviously. And yet, even a sum of money that big, $1.2 trillion, of which roughly half is for transportation infrastructure, could get sprinkled out without us feeling enough impact or effect unless we prioritize. And so what I want to give you a quick sense of is what we're going to prioritize as we work with, with states and with communities to deliver these dollars in a way that's really going to make a $1.2 trillion worth of difference in American lives. There are five things that we're really focused on. Safety, economic development, climate, equity, and transformation. We'll start with safety. It's not the sexiest, but it's actually the, the foundation of everything else. This is the reason the Department of Transportation exists. We have a Department of Transportation first and foremost to make sure everybody can get to where they need to go safely. And safety is supposed to be the kind of thing you take for granted. The better it's working, the less you even notice it's, it's a thing. You would be distracted right now if you were worried whether this was a safe place to be in the event of a fire. And a bunch of quiet rules and regulations and codes, and little exit signs and evacuation plans, and a very well-run fire department and a lot of other things see to it that we, you don't have to worry about that so we can pay attention to this actual conversation. Same thing with safety and transportation. You can go about your life paying attention to the things that actually matter in your life if you're not worried about whether you're going to be safe. There have been amazing strides in transportation safety on something like aviation. It's not unusual to have a year where there are zero deaths in commercial aviation in the United States. But on the roadways, we basically take it as a given, as, as normal, as a sort of cost of doing business that thousands and thousands of people will die every year. As a matter of fact, about 38,000 people lost their lives on American roadways last year. And if you just stop and think about that for a second, everyone here can picture the faces of people in your life who've been lost in a traffic crash. Every one of us, as if we were a society living through a war. And I don't believe it has to be that way, especially because we've seen that specific steps that have been taken in a number of places have dramatically reduced the rate of roadway fatalities. And so that's part of what we're going to put this money toward, making it safer to get to where you need to be and to be behind the wheel in this country. Safety. We can clap for that. Economic strength. There's a reason that this bill was called the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The president is very focused on making sure that the U.S. is positioned to win the century, to compete with any other country, notably China making enormous investments in their transportation infrastructure. Not because the Chinese Communist Party is full of transportation nerds like me, but because strategically as a country they understand how important it is for their economic future. This is what countries do. This is what the United States has historically done. Except we sort of skipped about 40 years in terms of investing at the rate we really should have to have the kind of infrastructure that'll back our economic growth. So we're going to make sure that we drive economic opportunity through great transportation. And that's true both in terms of the immediate jobs that are going to be created, right? The actual working on the installing the electric chargers and the uh, uh, laying of the track and, and all of the things that go into actually creating the improvements on roads and bridges and rail and transit and airports and ports that we're doing through, through this funding. But also the jobs that they support, even if you don't work in a field that has anything to do with construction or transportation, right? Because you were better connected to opportunity. We have an enormous opportunity to prepare America's economy for the future through first-rate transportation. Third, climate. Every transportation decision is a climate decision, whether we recognize it or not. As a matter of fact, in the U.S. economy, the biggest sector in terms of contributions to greenhouse gas emissions is the transportation sector, which means that, in my view, that that's a challenge for us in transportation to try to be the biggest part of the solution. Not only that, not only do we have to cut emissions from transportation on our roads with electric vehicles in every means of getting around by making it uh, so that you don't have to drag two tons of metal with you to get to where you need to go all the time, uh, even in aviation and shipping, 
But also, we've got to prepare for the climate impacts that are already happening. I was just in Colorado a couple weeks ago, I-70. Talk about a, a, a perfect storm of climate impacts uh, because of droughts and fires followed by floods. There was a mudslide that took out a key stretch of I-70 down a canyon where there's not really any alternatives, there's not really anywhere else to go, and uh, made it inaccessible because of that extreme weather event. In the Pacific Northwest, we had those heat waves last year. They had to shut down transit in Oregon because the cables were in danger of literally melting in that heat wave. I don't need to tell Texas about climate events. I mean, a year ago, people were melting snowballs in their toilets in order to be able to flush them in Texas because Texas froze over. It should not get that cold in Texas. It should not get that hot in Oregon. And a 500-year flood should not be an annual event. But it's happening. And that impacts our transportation infrastructure. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to build the road the exact way you would have built it before it got washed out, knowing that it's going to get washed out again. That's what I mean when I talk about resilience as part of our climate agenda and transportation. Fourth, equity. It is so, so important with this much money going into our transportation system that we deploy it in ways that are going to benefit everybody. And that hasn't always been the case in the past. So many communities around the United States can tell stories about how uh, an infrastructure decision that may have been made in the 50s or the 60s chewed up a minority neighborhood, divided a white neighborhood from a black neighborhood. The very, the very phrase, wrong side of the tracks, is in our vocabulary of American English for a reason. Infrastructure can and should connect, but sometimes it divides. We have a responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen this time around and to make sure that the jobs that are going to be created are available to everybody, including in fields that have been traditionally very male or very white, but could be open to everybody. A lot of great pathways into the middle class through the kinds of construction, for example, and, and transportation jobs that are being created. So that's part of what I'm getting at when I talk about equity. And then transformation. We're at South By, so I, I'm not in a position to lecture on the subject of transformation to an audience that is very focused on the future. I will say that I think the 2020s will probably be one of the most transformative periods we've ever seen in transportation. You look at what's happening with electric vehicles, you look at what's happening with automated vehicles, you look at what's happening with drones, I mean even commercial space travel. Uh, these things are happening, they're upon us, and we have an opportunity to prepare the way to make sure that the development of these innovations benefits us in terms of public policy goals, benefits all those other things I was talking about, makes us safer makes us more equitable and more climate ready and resilient economy, creates the kinds of jobs that we need for the future. Uh, and a lot of that depends on the choices that we make with this investment, because we're not probably gonna get another one. Let me just mention one other thing, just to level with everybody, and then we'll jump into the discussion. This is gonna take a while. I give a lot of interviews where the first question I get is, all right, wh what are we gonna see this summer? And I will say, you will see more construction starting to happen as early as this summer in some places as a result of this bill. But this is not like, for example, the economic stimulus of 2009, where the idea was to get as much money pumped into our economy as possible to stimulate demand and deal with high unemployment. This is a very different economic reality right now, and there's a very different purpose behind this bill. This is not about short-term stimulus. This is about getting ready for the long term. We are building cathedrals. And some of what we do will play out across this decade, immediately creating jobs through the decade, actually building this stuff, but then supporting our life as a country for literally as long as anyone in here is alive. And that's one of the reasons I'm so, so fired up about the opportunity on our hands. So hopefully that gives you just a sketch of what we're doing, how we're approaching it. Uh, but again, really eager to jump into a conversation. So I will suspend the monologue right there. I've been told there are microphones. I can't actually see them. So if you're next to one, maybe you can give a wave. And in the meantime, I will... Oh, there's one. There's a little spotlight on it. You could go there. And I think... Is there one in the other aisle too? Great. Doesn't have the spotlight, but people are waving. So I'm just going to go kind of one, two, one, two. And maybe if a really interesting question comes up through the Slido thing, I'll try to... I'll try to jump over to that, too. And uh, please just take a second to introduce yourself as you're starting your question. Go ahead, please. Hey, Pete. My name's Taylor. Uh, I'm from Austin. But I'm really interested in um, two things. One is um, transportation in cities, 
that make way for bicycles and scooters so they actually have a means of where they can and cannot go. And then secondly, highways, interstate, with using some sort of recycled or um, you know, byproduct to put into the, um, uh, into the road development hmm. so that it's more longer lasting and a little flexible so it doesn't uh, break apart as much. Can you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so two of my favorite subjects, cities and, and, uh, and pavement. Uh, so <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Uh, so on the city front, obviously there's a lot behind that. Um, but but uh, one thing that you mentioned is micro-mobility. First time I ever rode one of those scooters, by the way, was at South by a few years ago. There were a bunch of mayors here. I thought that was, thought that was pretty cool. Um, and, you know, we were one of the first cities in, in South Bend to do dockless bike share. And we're very proud that, uh, that we did that. There are so many ways for people to get around communities that are changing, that are new. And we're not chasing the new things because they're new, but we do want to work with communities as they discover what's new. Especially if it changes the right answer on some of the decisions that communities are making around things like transit. So if the last mile to get you from your home to a transit hub could be covered by a, a scooter or an e-bike or, uh, or, or some other, other uh, different means of getting around that just wasn't there before, we should be preparing for that. The biggest thing I think we need to do in cities is create alternatives. Give people different means of getting to where they're going, especially in cities where many people had no choice but to take a car. And uh, we're not anti-car, but we need to create more alternatives, and uh, in particular more alternatives to cars with just one person in them at a time uh, in order to relieve congestion and deal with pollution. Okay, pavement. There are a lot of reasons, market failures, political incentives, various reasons why I think we as a country are behind the curve on the potential of different forms of material. I don't want to, I'm worried some eyes are going to glaze over if I really get into the subject of material, but, but just stay with me because this is really important. Simple example. When I was mayor of South Bend, we had a huge issue with our stormwater system not being able to keep up with stormwater. And one of the things that happens when you have a giant rainfall, of which, of course, there will be more and more and more with climate change, is that the water hits the pavement, sheets off of it, and then that goes into the stormwater system as well. Uh, it overloads. And if your city was constructed the way mine was, and a lot of cities were, especially in the Midwest, that actually mixes with the wastewater system. And next thing you know, the water, the sewage, which has nowhere else to go, goes into people's basements. Lots of phone calls to the mayor's office when that happens. And so we started working, uh, and my predecessor got the ball rolling on this, with uh, uh, what's called permeable pavement. Basically, it, it, it kind of drinks up the water instead of it sheeting off. That little change had huge implications for the management of water. They're coming up with approaches to carbon negative manufacturing of concrete and cement. It's not yet uh, cost effective, but it could become cost effective uh, if we support it in the right way. Even just coming up with asphalt that lasts longer than it used to by two or three years could have a huge economic difference. And so these are the kinds of things that, again, there's not a real market return to coming up with this in the private sector alone. So I think federally supported research is going to be very important. And we are really big on some of the opportunities there. And, and recycled materials are a big part of it too. So I love the question. Yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that part of the goal is to build cathedrals, uh, infrastructure that lasts. And with the proliferation and availability of passive sensors, active sensors, connected devices, things that don't need to be battery powered or can be inductive powered, uh, could you speak to how we could measure stress strain in real time in the future? Uh, the opportunity being now to embed these sensors in bridges, in other infrastructural elements, so that we could measure for the next hundred years how these are faring, uh, passively measure where deficits may occur, yeah. uh, et cetera. Yeah, uh, I mean, one of the things that the images that's flashing before my mind as you say that is the, the DeSoto Bridge in Memphis. It connects Memphis to Arkansas. It goes over the river. A uh, really key economic juncture. And I went out and saw it because it had to be closed because uh, somebody noticed an almost cartoon-style rift in the steel, just a two-inch gap, just slashing right down the middle of a steel beam that was structurally very important. I assume every steel beam in a bridge is structurally important, but this one certainly was <laughs> because they immediately closed it. Um, and you know, there's a review going on into how the inspections uh, weren't able to catch it sooner, but we still have an inspection regime that's mostly dependent on somebody with a clipboard 
I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not really. I mean, somebody eyeballing these things. Um, so it's very appealing to think about being able to integrate certain things into pieces of infrastructure themselves so that they can tell us when they're under stress or in trouble. I think this needs in particular to be part of our resilience agenda because we're gonna see so many more kinds of stress and strain and damage with extreme weather events. The trick, of course, is you don't wanna do something just because you can. So there are some cases where actually optical sensing might be better, whether that's a person with a clipboard or with drones, you can, you can scan the length of a, uh, of, of a bridge or a road much more quickly or efficiently than, than you used to. And you know, if that's more efficient than putting a sensor in every 100 feet, so much the better. Because otherwise you gotta take care of the sensors. And, then you have a sensor to tell you when the sensor isn't working. You know, not really. But you need to think about the total cost of ownership and the long tail of some of these things. But having said that, I think there's enormous potential in this. And again, this is an area where I don't think it's as much a market gap as the pavements because I think there's, there is a pretty good return to, to doing things in a shorter term. But I still think there will need to be a federal and academic and public sector role driving some of the research on this in addition to the work that the private sector can do to really meet the potential of those technologies. And uh, it's, it's really compelling to see how they could ultimately save lives in line with the safety mission of the department that I led with. So thanks for raising that. Thank you. Hello. Hey Pete, um, I'm really curious if you could dive into more detail about your agenda, when it, both short term and long term when it comes to uh, policy making surrounding uh, fully autonomous vehicles mm -hmm. and as they continue to proliferate, especially within regards to the trucking industry. Yeah. So with the, the strange thing, as, as you know, if you've been coming to a place like South By for, for any amount of time, is that it sometimes feels as if the widespread adoption of fully autonomous uh, cars, for example, has been promised as being exactly 10 years away for at least seven years, right? And it always feels like it's just permanently over the horizon. And yet, if you look at how widespread level two automation is, that's you know nudging you back into your lane, checking whether you're paying attention, that kind of thing that many new cars have standard, uh, and getting into level three and level four, these things are coming. And if I'm being honest about it, I, I would say that the policy frameworks have not fully caught up with the technology. The safety potential for uh, autonomous driving is enormous, right? I just mentioned earlier, human, human drivers do not have a good track record. Human drivers have killed 38,000 people last year. So the potential is extremely appealing. Also, think about the accessibility potential, especially for people with disabilities, uh, to be able to get around more, more freely. Um, but we got to cross from here to there, and there are a lot of safety worries between here and, and where they're actually widespread. There are cybersecurity questions and a whole bunch of other things that surround those. And so what we need to do is create a policy framework that is going to set those left and right boundaries, make sure anything that hits the market is safe, but recognize that this is still largely in its infancy and create enough room for experimentation for companies to be able to develop their technologies, which is what you see happening mostly in the local context. I think it's okay to allow that, that um, experimentation to, to, to flourish up uh, until and unless we start seeing real, uh, uh, real escalation in, in some of the safety concerns. And there, there, are some, um, there, there are some kind of built in speed breaks on that with how many vehicles of this kind you can test under our permitting systems. Um, here's something to think about, just in terms of the way we design regulation. If, if you think about it, there is a division of labor where the federal government regulates vehicles, right? We do airbag standards and crash tests and, and federal motor vehicle safety standards, recalls. And the states regulate the driver, right? The BMV, the driver test, the license. So what are you supposed to do when the car is the driver? That's, that's a challenge that, that we still need to work out just in terms of federalism, right? What states should be in charge of and what we need to handle at the federal level. Uh, legislators are thinking about this too. Um, so no easy answers here, but I do think we're gonna see very meaningful development on this in the 2020s. You mentioned trucking, huge issue, uh, right? We, we talk about supply chains. It, sometimes one of the main reasons you see all those ships backed up off the coast is actually because of a shortage of truck, available truck drivers a thousand miles inland. And so, of course, it points to the attraction of, of uh, uh, some means of, uh, of using automated technology to move goods more smoothly. Um, especially because with trucking, you're working on a more defined route, right? It's not just the onboard technology. 
if you have a road and a vehicle talking to each other. That's how you can really make sure that, that it's safe and efficient. Um, and this pre presents a lot of concerns for folks who work in that industry, but also actually creates a lot of jobs. You're gonna need safety drivers, people working those sensors, installing them, making sure that, that, that they are, um, uh, they're working properly. So there actually may be a lot of job creation in automation if we train up for it. But I will say, I think the bigger issue, the more immediate issue with trucking is just to enhance job quality in trucking. We need to treat truck drivers like the essential workers that they are. That means better parking, better conditions, better compensation. Um, and that's on my mind too. Great set of questions, thank you. Hello. Hi Pete, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Laura Brown, I'm here from Nashville, Tennessee, where a week before the COVID lockdown started in 2020, my neighborhood was decimated by an EF3 tornado. This tornado was over two thirds of a mile wide and it stayed on the ground for almost 100 miles. It caused one and a half billion dollars in damages to my community in Middle Tennessee. Climate change is an increasing threat to our communities and I don't think that we're doing enough to fight it. I'm curious what specific policies you are most excited about that will move the needle on carbon emissions in the US and what policies we can advocate for on the local level. Great. Um, well, first of all, thanks for sharing the story of your community because we need to start with the premise that climate change is real. I'm sorry we have to s still say that in 2022, but I think it's important to say it uh, so that people understand what we're up against. And not real in the sense that, that you know, the theories are right that it'll happen someday. Real as in it has become a reality affecting people in our everyday lives. And as I mentioned earlier, even damaging our transportation systems. And I agree with you, we need to do more. But let me tell you what we're doing and what's possible because of this bill. First of all, I'm very excited about the electric vehicle provisions with this bill. Electric vehicle charging stations, for example, setting up a network of 500,000 charging stations uh, across uh, every part of our highway system. So that in the same way you know when you hit the road that, that there's gonna be a gas station between you and where you're going if you're on the interstate, you know the same thing is true of chargers. We also need to make sure that, that the electric vehicle revolution happens on equitable terms because there are a lot of people who would be those who would benefit the most from the fuel savings, but are either priced out of EVs right now, or they live in multifamily dwellings, and, and it's not as simple as just plugging in uh, in your garage the way Chaston and I do with our minivan. We became minivan people when we had twins, and we got a plug-in <laughs> hybrid minivan. Um, and that's gonna be a big part of it. But even if every car out there is electric, that's not enough. We're working on sustainable aviation fuels to make aviation more climate friendly, deal with the life cycle emissions of those fuels. We're uh, now part of several international agreements involving shipping. So on one hand, pound for pound, moving something over the ocean is one of the least carbon intensive ways to do it. On the other hand, there's so much of it that goes on and the fuel oil that those ships burn is so dirty, for lack of a better term, that that, that needs to, the technologies need to change. And even port side, uh, electrifying the, the ports is a really important part of how we can cut emissions. We also just need to make, uh, give people options to live in places where they don't have to cover as much ground to get about their daily lives. Earlier today I was at uh, a spot in Austin called uh, Saltillo, the station where uh, uh, th there's a, a transit station envisioned as becoming a, a f an even uh, more vibrant future hub, but surrounded by transit-oriented development that makes it easy for people to move around, as I said earlier, without having to drag two tons of metal with them everywhere they go. Uh, making after transportation uh, easier, making it easier and safer to get where you are on two wheels. Um, these are all things that have a big climate impact and they all add up. So those are some of the things we're working on. Oh, and transit. Almost just by definition, uh, when more people ride transit, uh, there is a major climate benefit to that. But also within that, we are funding uh, a, a bus and bus facilities program and then a low and no emissions uh, program to help transit agencies buy electric buses that are cleaner uh, and that uh, that's another important part of the climate solution. So that's all the stuff we're doing. Well, some of the stuff we're doing. What more can we do and should we do? Well, one thing is, it would be great if electric vehicles were affordable for everybody and they just aren't yet. And we could have tax credits. Matter of fact, our administration has proposed tax credits that would make them much more affordable. So you look at, uh, for example, the entry level US made pickup trucks that start around 40,000 bucks if you're talking about a Silverado or an F-150. Um, we could bring the price of those into the high 20s and it would just open up that option for millions more families. And 
I think it's a good policy, and I think we ought to do it. It just hasn't happened yet. Now, you, your, your question, you did say, what can we advocate for at the local level? So let me circle back to the first part. So many of the most important decisions about this are actually local. Because it's not just about the transportation technology. It's about the way communities and neighborhoods are built. Are they built in a way that people can get to where they need to be, on foot or on transit? Uh, or if they're driving, are they built in such a way that it's easy to charge uh, an electric vehicle? Those things really add up. Buildings themselves are a big source of emissions. The way we design them, how uh, robust they are to, to uh, be heated and, and, and cooled in low power and efficient ways, that's a big deal. And by the way, most of the federal funding uh, that, uh, that goes through my department, the actual decisions are made at the state or local level by design. So we can encourage a lot of things. And with the discretionary funding, we can actually uh, uh, identify and select the projects that went out. But most of it goes out through a formula. So the real decisions are, are happening much closer to home and not in Washington. Uh, so making the case for the right decisions at the local level is incredibly important. And, um, and a good city, a good community will have processes to include those voices. Uh, and if you don't see those processes, you should fight for them to be created. Thanks. Hello. Uh, hi, Secretary Buttigieg. My name is Teddy, and I'm a sophomore here in, in Austin. Right. And I was wondering how your administration is going to work with young people like me in schools to help get more environmentally friendly transportation. Great. Um, well, this is one of the reasons why, first of all, we've got to create good transit options to get you to where you need to be, right? Um, and uh, make sure that you have active transportation, because there's a whole generation that I think expects to be able to have better ways to, to bike and, and to get around. Um, I also think that we need to, frankly, harness the, to tie your question back to the last question, harness the moral authority of people who are students today who will spend your entire life shaped by climate decisions that are being made now. I, I don't like admitting that I'm from a different generation than somebody in college right now, but I, I have to accept that that's a reality. Um, and so you have a lot more moral authority than I do just talking about why it's so important to do this. And uh, let me emphasize also again the, the local nature of so many of these decisions. But federally what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that when projects come our way that, for example, can connect a campus to a downtown or a home to a workplace uh, or a community to another community and can do it in a way that cuts emissions, that meets our climate goals, that's something that's gonna be much more competitive uh, than, than one that doesn't. Uh, so we're gonna literally work it into the way that uh, so many of these funds, so much of this $660 billion in transportation funding goes out. And then back it up with some of the work that's happening in other departments, like the Department of Energy, which is working to upgrade the grid. And again, universities are unique and interesting places to do new and exciting things around distributed energy, uh, around uh, distributed generation, uh, combined heat and power, a lot of things that are dramatically better from an emissions perspective that are especially suited to a university context. So hopefully you're, you're able to dial into some conversations that might even be happening on campus about how the university itself relates to the surrounding community. Um, I'm actually a sophomore in high school. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't quite vote yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I assumed you meant uh, you were a UT Austin. Uh, uh, shame on me. All right, so I'm definitely not in the same generation as you. That, <laughs> um, can you. Can you unpack your question a little bit, just in terms of what, um, like, what's it like for you to get around your community, or what would be greener options that you feel like you don't have right now? Um, a lot of the high schools in the Austin area, or at least where I live in East Austin, a lot of it's not, like, accessible easily by like train or like yeah. scooter or anything like that like it takes me 15 minutes across the highway to get to school each day mm -hmm. and there's not really a bus or eco-friendly option i see yeah so so this is this definitely comes down to to transit but also to design right so as you know 35 kind of cuts off the east from the rest of the community we've talked a lot about reconnecting communities the mayor's uh, been talking a lot about a vision that would uh, cap part of 35 so that you can go straight across it which also does that rarest of things creates new land which is pretty uh, pretty special um, and okay everything i just said about moral authority is also even more true i would argue for somebody in high school who even though you can't vote can really get a lot of attention, uh, com rightfully command a lot of attention by speaking up about these issues. So I hope you'll continue to do that. And I hope by the time you're running a federal agency or whatever you aspire to do in the future that we will have made a lot of progress 
by the time a high school student is asking you what, what you're doing to make their future better. Thanks so much for the question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gretchen Newcomb, and I'm with Mobility Data. We're a global nonprofit that facilitates the standardization of data specs for seamless multimodal transportation worldwide. We govern the expansion and maintenance of the de facto data specs called GTFS for transit and GBFS for shared mobility. And the traveling public and a large, diverse ecosystem of public and private sector stakeholders rely on our open SAT source data every day. We probably have at least a million touch points a day on our data. So my question to you, because I don't hear data talked about a lot within the infrastructure conversation yet, and my question is how does the DOT classify this complex data pipeline that we are currently building with the ecosystem, and what kind of conversations are you having to support its continued existence and accessibility to the market? Wow. Um. <laughs> All right, you, you had me at standardization of transportation data specs. Um, it is hugely important, and if I'm, if I'm not talking, although I'll admit a couple of the things you mentioned will take me a little out of my depth, but I'll speak to it at, at the policy level. Um, because if I'm not mentioning data a lot, it's largely just because it's so much infused in what we do that it's almost like the air we breathe. Uh, it, but it's deeply important to every one of the agenda items that, that we talked about. Uh, so w whether we're talking about safety, right, we're actually... One of the challenges we have moving toward what we call Vision Zero, and, and the, the overall idea of Vision Zero is moving toward where there's zero traffic deaths, but to, to, to find the steps along the way, I want to be able to identify, lift up, and celebrate communities that have had zero traffic deaths in a given day or week or month, and the data actually doesn't exist in a comprehensive, interoperable, or open format to allow us to, to even do that from where we're sitting. Um, from uh, uh, an equity perspective, I have better data about the location of every aircraft in the national airspace than I do about how many of our dollars actually get anywhere near a DBE once they go past the prime level of, of contracts. Uh, from a climate perspective, we're pushing states to uh, set their own, they can set their own standards, but, but, but to actually go through that work to do it uh, in order to evaluate kind of what's actually happening from a climate perspective as a consequence of transportation decisions. And forms of data that are housed in open source consortia are especially important because they have a richness that can be used for data and policy purposes alike. Often, our job is not necessarily to curate or own or dictate or specify the, the data sets. Uh, often, simply by recognizing, tapping, or using them, we can uh, confer a certain amount of, uh, of agreement or legitimacy on their collection. Um, and so when you talk about the standardizations that, that need to happen, look, sometimes it is very much our job, right, as a government to, to create certain standards. Um, but, uh, but other times it makes more sense for uh, an open format to flourish and then for us to, to try to tap into it. Thank you. So you would consider it as critical infrastructure as the bridges and roads that you're building? Yeah, I mean, data infrastructure, digital infrastructure, no question. And uh, it's a very important part of how we make better decisions. And if we get it right, how we meet all of those other policy goals I talked about. So thanks for your work. Hello, Secretary uh, Buttigieg. My name's Stephen. I'm from San Marcos, Texas, just down the road. And my question has to do with public transportation and climate change and electric cars. All I hear about is we need to reduce our carbon footprint by an electric car. But if everybody buys an electric car, we need more batteries. The power that it's coming from is still not necessarily clean. Whereas I've never heard myself the argument of we need to make public transportation what's happening in this country. And by doing that, we'll reduce our greenhouse gases. Instead of everybody go buy an electric car, I feel like it should be like, let's get a really good transportation system so nobody needs to have a car in the first place. Or at least, you know, outside of understanding if you live in the country or something, you, yeah. it's impractical. But why isn't that argument being made for public transportation? Yeah. No, I think it's a really important point. If we could electrify every car in the country and we wouldn't, we wouldn't meet our goals. Uh, so this is exactly why no one piece is going to get it done, right? Here's one way to think about it. Think about, think about the carbon footprint of a trip that you take in a car today. There are at least three things you could do to, to, to deal with it. One would be to just change the, still take the trip in the car, but you change the carbon footprint of that trip. That's what an EV is about, right? 
And the good news is, it'll only get cleaner as we go. So yeah, an EV is only as clean as the, the fuel source that goes into the electricity. Although this is an important point, because sometimes, like in my Twitter mentions, I say something about EVs and somebody thinks they've really nailed me. And they're like, ah, well, what you never thought about was it takes fossil fuels to make electricity. Well, yes, but as you probably know, at the utility scale, it's more efficient, right? So it is still more efficient, even with a fossil source, to turn it into power at a utility generation site turn it into electrons and put that, those electrons into your car than it is to take that fossil fuel, put it into your car and set it on fire inside your car, right? I mean, if you just think about it, it's more efficient. Um, but obviously, it's it, the, the climate benefit of that grows is we actually move toward renewable energy. Anyway, so there's track one, take that car trip, make it more uh, climate friendly. Track two is take that trip, but don't take it in a, in a car. And that's mode shifting, right? As your question implies, a big part of this is quality transit. And this is especially challenging actually in smaller communities where you have a bus system, but maybe it only runs once an hour and maybe it only runs nine to five. If we can support transit options to be more frequent and to correspond to when and where people actually work, which means reimagining the routes and having the right frequency, then we're empowering those, those, those workers or, or those commuters, but we're also, meaning, we're also saying that that trip, instead of being taken by you sitting alone in your car and the car next to you is somebody else sitting alone going the same place, you know, we, we can do that in, in a transit vehicle. Now the third thing you can do is avoid the need for that trip to be taken at all. And that's where city decision, community decisions, planning decisions come in. That's why the way we even lay out our communities, I think, is important. Can we make them more walkable? Can we make them uh, better organized in terms of what it takes to get from, from home to work to, to, to the store, to church, to wherever it is you need to go? And I, I agree with you that if all we do is change everybody to EVs, it won't be enough. I also believe we have to really work hard on EVs because that's one technology that's actually in our hands right now. Uh, and we know that, that right now we're working with the, the built environment that, that we've all inherited, right? But, but strongly agree. So, so, so the focus is a superior transportation system, cleaner car trips when you're taking a car, and uh, fewer trips that, that you wish you didn't have to take in the first place. We do those three things together. I think we're in a much better place with, tr with transportation emissions and climate. It's a great question. Thank you. Hi, Pete. How are you? Good on. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, so I am here more with a request than a question. Okay. And my request is that you would please visit, you and your team, visit pleasepete.com. Oh, OK. Um, it's essentially a letter to you. And it's a request um, hoping that you would visit um, Gulf Coast communities that are impacted by offshore oil things and are, yeah, getting nervous. Um, Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, please prioritize, prioritize the communities. Visit them, please, uh, over at the oil companies. Okay. That's Thank you. I'll, I'll check out the website. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Eli. I'm a freshman at Fordham University from the Bronx. And I wanted to ask you about the Boring Company and technologies like it. If I'm not mistaken, there's a little bit of money in the infrastructure bill dedicated to technologies like that. But how do you think that becomes something that's realistically implemented? And if you do think it's realistic, what do you think the timeline for something like that is? So what we know about that technology is it's delivered a remarkable step change in the efficiency of building a certain kind of tunnel. And it's extremely impressive. Um, what it would need, what we would need to see in order for that to become part of kind of large scale transportation planning or, or uh, deployment is a few other related problems to be solved. So basically what they've done is they've solved the problem of how do you make a narrow tunnel uh, dramatically more efficiently than, than you do with traditional forms of boring. The related questions are, can you do it, first of all, can you do it on a bigger tunnel uh, so that you could actually move a lot of people through it at the same time? Can you do it in a way that would support the development of an integrated network as opposed to just a line from, from point A to point B? Can you do it in a way that, that meets the, the needs that, that a transit system has, for example, in terms of accessibility for different kinds of, of, of passengers and commuters, um, in terms of uh, safety, having enough e egress points for, for fire or, or other issues that can happen? 
um, and other things that kind of make it viable as, as part of a, a widespread network as opposed to a single, uh, a single path. Um, I'm not raising all those as, as barriers, by the way, why it's not exciting. I'm just saying those are some of the things that, that would be on the pathway from, from that particular discovery, which is a, a really impressive one, to being part of the mainstream of how we, how we dig tunnels and, and, and set up subways, for example, in the US. We do have uh, some funding for research. It's one of the, the uh, cooler things I think people don't know that my department does a lot of. Um, and we don't, I mean, obviously, nobody needs uh, the federal government to come in and figure out how to do that tunnel thing, because the company did it. That's an example of something the private sector does well. Um, but what we need to do is, is create some of the conditions where those other, uh, we can go after some of those other problems, too. But finding new ways to do what we've always done, just to zoom out a little bit, is incredibly important because there is a lot of evidence from human experience that major projects, especially when they rise to the level that you would call a mega project, going all the way back to the Lincoln, t I mean, going all the way back to the pyramids, actually, uh, almost as if by a law of physics, tend to be over budget and late. And we just can't have a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure projects out of this administration be over budget and late. They need to be on time, on task, and on budget. So figuring out how to do that involves solving a lot of questions, only some of which are technical. Actually, a lot of them are kind of political, legal, bureaucratic, kind of getting those barriers uh, out of the way uh, while still meeting our, our bedrock commitments and our important needs. But part of it, of course, is the search for new, better technology. And I'm excited about some of the things that are being developed. So great question. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for coming to Austin. We're very fortunate to have you. Uh, my name is Tony Elkins. I work for a company called Meridian Infrastructure. We are one of the largest sustainable infrastructure developers in the world. We've developed LaGuardia Terminal, uh, C70 in Denver, uh, and we are signatories to the Paris Climate Accord. My question to you is, what ideas do you have federally to leverage federal infrastructure dollars with private capital through public-private partnerships to increase and quicken sustainable and equitable development. Private sector has hundreds of billions of dollars and we'd love to invest. Yeah. Thank you. Good, we'd love your hundreds of billions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, even the enormous sums that are in this infrastructure law, as you know, are not enough to do all of the building and the repairing that our country has to do on its infrastructure, much of which is in private hands. Uh, and much of which is, is, of course, publicly owned and operated. And so we are going to have to find leverage on the federal dollars that we have committed, and part of that is through responsible public-private partnerships. Um, the challenge, of course, is that, that a lot of public goods don't have a, a return that can be captured, and there has to be a good revenue stream for, for uh, a good P3. But, but there are so many models that, that can show how you do that. And by the way, as you know well, a lot of those models come from a place like, uh, uh, like Europe. I mean, you look at Spain, for example, um, that you know, is not a place that is falling down on labor or environmental standards relative to the United States, and yet is able to meet those and mobilize private capital in some very interesting and, and, and compelling ways. So what are we doing about it? We have a Build America Bureau and private, uh, private activity bonds. Uh, they're capped at a certain level, but, um, but we could be doing more with that capacity that we have. That, that's one thing. Another area where I see a lot of opportunity there is the transit-oriented development that uh, we were talking about and that we saw with, with Saltillo, where, um, uh, and, and that's happening in a lot of different places around the country, where you bring together the, the private partner who can unlock, especially some of the value out of the real estate play, connected up to public goals around housing affordability, maybe transit efforts, and, and, and stitch those things together into a, into a plan and, and, a, and a funding stack that makes sense for, for everybody. So I think that we can do more, and I think we're poised to do more with some of the funding that's available to us and some of the flexibility my department has, and very much open and eager for more ideas on how to do it, uh, because we need to innovate if we really want to uh, meet this moment in terms of the need for infrastructure investment and improvement. Look forward to working Thank with you. Thank you. Hi. Howdy, Secretary Pete. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Jacoby. I'm with Texas Campaign for the Environment. I suppose I'm one of the uh, architects behind pleasepeat.com. Okay. Uh, you've already been asked to visit the Gulf. I'm going to encourage you to do so. I've also got a letter from 16 different frontline leaders along the Texas uh, Gulf Coast and Louisiana who are urging you to step in and stop the crude oil export terminals that are proposed for the Gulf 
So my question is, as the secretary who oversees MARAD, which is the agency responsible for permitting these facilities, will you account for equity and environmental justice when it comes to overburdened communities who are dealing with these pollution issues and staring down the barrel of massive crude export facilities moving forward? Also, I brought you a t-shirt. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, look, uh, as you can imagine, coming into this, I haven't been briefed on some of the specifics of, of the area of concern, so I'm going to research, and, and it looks like you've prepared all kinds of information for me to look at. We're happy um, to brief you. Okay. <laughs> but, but to respond to your question, we care deeply, of course, we care deeply about equity and environmental justice. And we need to make sure, as a matter of, of, of uh, doing the right thing, but also as a matter of law, right, that... Uh, communities' rights aren't trampled when it comes to any kind of infrastructure development. And uh, I can commit to you that that's a responsibility we take very seriously, and also commit to you that I'll learn more about this, this specific issue. Uh, and I'll take the T-shirt home with me. Thank you. Done. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. There you go. All right. All righty. Thank you. I'll just... Uh, <laughs> Put it over here. <laughs> Promise I won't forget it. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Adrian. Uh, my name is Ryan Jepetsky. Uh, I was the founder of Jump Bikes, one of the earliest uh, dockless bike share companies. Um, I spent 10 years of my career trying to retrofit bicycles into cities that were predominantly built for cars. Yeah. Uh, it's very difficult to do that. Um, so much of uh, transportation planning is just reacting to bad land use decisions mm -hmm. that, as you said, you know, are happening at the local level. And so what can you, as a transportation secretary, particularly one that was a mayor and understands that balance between local and federal, what can the federal governments, what can state governments do uh, to have better, better land use decisions locally mm -hmm. that would allow for the creation of these you know, rich, mixed-use, vibrant neighborhoods that we want to see be being built uh, instead of yeah. uh, car-dependent communities. Yeah, I mean, this is a great example of how things that touch transportation go beyond the transportation technology itself, right? As you said, a lot of it's the land use that forces people into certain trips or forces trips into certain modes and that we could be doing a better job on. So in terms of the local federal balance, what I found, and maybe this is the former mayor in me speaking, uh, <coughs> but a lot of times the community's already there. The city or the, the, the mayor or the, the community wants to do the right thing. And they find it difficult uh, in the context of their state environment. Or sometimes they even find it difficult in the context of federal requirements. And that's where I want to make sure that we, uh, first of all, get out of our own way. But, but also that we give cover to communities that are trying to do the right thing. Uh, for example, when we were trying to do complete streets in, in our community of South Bend, and we created streetscapes that were ones where they still work for cars, but, but also worked for, for pedestrians and bicyclists. And it meant increasing commute times by like a minute. And you would have thought I was banning the automobile downtown. People were so pissed. <laughs> Until we did it. After we did it, it was fine. People, I think, forget it was any other way sometimes. But during that, it was a battle. And I just got a little bit of a favorable nod from the then Department of Transportation leadership, Secretary Fox. We got an award for our, for our, our, our designs. And just a little bit of cover like that, mm -hmm. that we were in fact doing something that was not boneheaded or anti-efficiency, really helped. I also think one thing we should be probably doing a better job of is using your data. So as a mayor who adopted dockless bike share, wanted to do bike share before you all thought up dockless bike share and, and, and never could do it because we couldn't afford the docks. And then, of course, you had to guess where the docking stations ought to go, and, and sometimes it was hard to get that right. You have the patterns of what people actually do and what people are forced to do by the built environment that they're actually riding these bicycles in, right? And the more some version of that data can either be made open or if that's not the, the right thing to do business-wise, um, at least made accessible to policymakers in some way, I think that can fuel better, better decisions. And we could be on our way to a whole new universe of possibilities of land use. I'll give you another example, circling back to the example of automated vehicles. So one thing that planners can't stand is surface parking. There's so many good ideas 
don't quite make it because there's a surface parking requirement. You just can't find the, the, the room to do it. In a world of automated vehicles where more of the vehicles just come and get a passenger or other solutions with mobility as a service, um, there's dramatically less need for, for, for land to be used that way, and it opens up whole new possibilities. Also, of course, there was a, a, an amazing amount of experimentation in land use and right-of-way use that happened as a consequence of COVID as these streets got turned into anything from restaurant seating to pedestrian uh, or, or bikeways. I'm not saying we are going to lock in those patterns that, that were introduced because of a specific situation, but, but shame on us if we snap right back into 2019 like we didn't learn anything, right? And so what I think my department can do is, again, create a little bit of cover and sometimes a little bit of financial support through things like our Complete Streets funding or transportation alternatives fund, uh, program, or even just uh, you know, showing that we uh, have a lot of regard for applications for competitive grants for, let's say, street upgrades that account for these kinds of things you're talking about. All of that can help move things in the right direction, even if a lot of these decisions are ultimately playing out at the local level. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Buzz Smith, the UV Angelist. Um, don't boo everybody. The first 10 years of my career was in oil and gas. I like this already. EV <laughs> Angelist. All right. I'm spreading the good news of electric vehicles for the last 10 years like of my it. life. Got my first plug-in vehicle in 2012. My wife got one. 60 days later, we got one for our daughter when she got her driver's license. My dad now has one. My brother now has one. Look at that. So we're all electrified, never going back to gas. Back in 1985, during one of the oil field busts, I was in oil and gas, and I was a frontline worker. I worked in a machine shop as a manufacturing engineer building wellhead equipment. When that happened, Houston was devastated. Everybody lost their jobs. And then I lost my home. And we had to leave the town that I was born in and move up to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. By the way, it was a great decision, but uh, it was forced on me. Uh, houses on my street went for prices so low at auction that people bought them with credit cards. When people talk about disruption today, they think we're talking about disrupting businesses. We're talking about disrupting families and their lives. I'm all behind it. I love electric vehicles. But we've got to be planning for how are we going to retrain those front workers who built this country over the last 150 years and give them a better life. Through, and we've got to give them education, but they've got, they live paycheck to paycheck. They can't just take two years off to go get re-educated. How can we help them? You're right. Thank you. Well, thanks for sharing your story, first of all. And it you know, reminds me of something that happened in, in my community long before I was born, but we were still living with it when I grew up. Uh, we never had a lot of oil and gas in, in my part of Indiana, but we were an auto manufacturing town, went through that kind of bust that you're talking about. And my, my hometown was reeling from the loss of auto jobs for literally 50 years before we really were able to pick ourselves up and come out of it. So I know what it means when you have that kind of shock or that kind of transition and people get left behind. And we have a responsibility to make sure that the transition into new forms of transportation, new forms of energy, creates more opportunity and doesn't leave anybody behind. And by the way, we can. One of the things we're doing with our fund for electric buses is we're requiring that if a, a transit agency wants to use it for, for buying electric buses, which of course we're all for, they have to have a set aside for the training, the workforce training, so that the kinds of people who are good at operating or maintaining a diesel bus can get skilled up to do the same thing with an electric bus. We gotta make sure, you know, specifically in the energy sector, that we're connecting people up to the jobs. You know, the same skills that make somebody good at, at digging or maintaining a well, uh, make somebody really good at capping these wells that need to be capped, right? And we're gonna support that, we have to. Uh, it's morally the right thing to do, it's economically the right thing to do, and, and it can be part of a story where we come out of this with more and better jobs than we had. A few years ago, everybody was talking about green jobs or green collar jobs. That was a term. You don't hear it as much now, but it was, it was a real kind of buzzy term. But the more I look at the jobs that are being generated through these, these transitions, they're blue collar jobs. The majority of them are blue collar jobs um, in a green context. Uh, but we've got to make sure that the, the, the folks who have worked their whole lives honorably, responsibly, taking care of their family, 
sponsoring Little League, giving, giving every week at their church, chipping in, doing their part, uh, that those folks are first in line if an old line of work is changing to be able to benefit from that new line of work. And that's something I can tell you because he's looked me in the eye and talked about it. I can tell you it's very important to the president and it's very important to me too. Two other things, not a question. Yeah. Uh, one of you mentioned tax credits earlier. Yeah. If you don't have a very big tax burden, the tax credit doesn't help you afford an electric vehicle. And then oh. the other thing is... So is it, yes, okay. but oh, yeah. unless we make it refundable. Which, yes. Uh, which I think we ought to... Okay, and then the other thing is please stop the post office from buying more gas vehicles. There's never been a better application <laughs> for electric vehicles than going from mailbox to mailbox, that start and stop with degenerative braking and the maintenance savings alone. It's just the smart thing to do, and we cannot go the route that we're actually heading down right now. Thank I you. I hear you. Thank you. I think, see the shot clock here. This is going to have to be the last question, I'm afraid. Go ahead. Thank you so much. My name's Nisham Marks. I actually work for the Cincinnati Northern Kentucky Airport. Okay. And I have the privilege of being able to work on innovation. So I get to work on sustainable aviation fuels. We're able yeah. to work and actually have autonomous vehicles on campus. Yeah. One of the questions I have for you is about the rebirth of general aviation, mm. particularly around eVTOLs, VTOLs, STOLs, and the movement of goods and people into remote communities, yeah. not just in urban areas, but that true advanced air mobility. Yeah, very exciting. I mean, from electric VTOLs to, to, to uh, you know, UAVs and getting stuff to where they need to go. And, and there may be areas where we don't even need to run roads where we used to because we can just get things uh, aerially to where they need to be. Incredibly exciting. Of course, our main uh, function has to do with safety. So it's FAA making sure that it's safe, uh, making sure that the national airspace is, is uh, still orderly. Um, and I think we can do that. Uh, uh, but we also need to promote the development of anything that takes this in a direction that is zero or low emissions. And that's where the electric opportunity, look, it'll be a while before a wide body jet is, is, is functioning on anything but, uh, but fuel. Although we can have sustainable aviation fuel, uh, even in existing equipment. Uh, but some of these other use cases uh, are not as far away. And they're very exciting. I think they're very exciting in rural and Midwestern environments like the area around CVG. So uh, I'm excited to see how the airport community is preparing on the ground to be ready for these applications. And uh, we're getting ready for some of the challenges, the real challenges that, that, that uh, this creates, but also the enormous opportunity that, that uh, rests with these. And I'm, I'm as excited as you are for the future of air mobility. Thank you. Uh, like I said, that little, that little red light's blinking, so it must be somebody else's turn on this stage. But I just want to thank you for, for joining us. I hope you share in our excitement about what's possible right now. I hope you look up Build Back, or, or uh, uh, now I'm losing the website. I believe it's build.gov, but look up what we're doing with the bipartisan infrastructure, infrastructure law. And remember that most of the decisions about where most of these dollars are going to go will not be made in my building. They will be made in your community. And so you have more influence than you think on what's actually gonna happen to the future of American transportation. And as you do, I hope you'll think about some of those very important priorities that, that I just shared. Thanks again for the chance to be with you. Hope we'll meet again. Thank you.